I think one of the questions, your suggested questions, is is the uh, full symphonic score in the world of film scoring, is that even necessary anymore? Yeah. And I, th I thought that, like, that was the, my favorite of all the questions. So can I answer that one? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, it's, well, it, it, I love that people want to talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. So, mm -hmm. okay. If you were to ask any person walking down the street, can you sing the theme to Star Wars? They'll do it. They mm -hmm. can do it. Raiders of the Lost Ark. They'll do it. Yeah. Jaws, even. They'll go, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you ask them even for Psycho. <laughs> you know, they can imitate these classic iconic scores, right? Mm -hmm. Most importantly, they can sing the melodies. Princess Leia's theme. They can sing it. You ask just the regular common person. Now, I ask a group of composers now. Okay, a room full of composers. Okay, everybody, can everybody just sing the Star Wars theme? Everybody in unison, bom, 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 bom. right? Okay, great. I'm like, all right, thank you. Now, can everybody please sing the main theme to one of the biggest films, one of the biggest film composers of all time? Can you sing the main theme to Inception, please? Dead silence. Right. Can you sing the main theme to Dunkirk? Dead silence. <laughs> so yes. film scoring as we know it is changing. The idea of the light motif, which is of course taken from Wagner. Yes. Um, the the theme. Idea, you know, giving each character their own theme. Um, and in fact, they call Star Wars a space opera, right? Because it's so <laughs> clearly obvious that, you know, I mean, it's all mm. based on existing models. Every part of Star Wars is taken from something else. It was just remixed in a way that no one had ever done before. And that was the genius of Star Wars. But anyway, um, you know, so nobody can sing the themes to their, their favorite film scores. Yeah, you're saying they're less melodic because even though they're not... They are I less mean, melodic. They may or may not be using full orchestras but they're definitely using them in a different way. Like Hans Correct. Zimmer uses strings, I think, pretty sure in Inception and things. But um, yes. yes, like you well, said. The, the, the idea of the Brahm, the mm -hmm. Brahm, you know, that I think came about during Inception. You know, the idea of just creating these immense orchestral textures. So, mm -hmm. you know, Yes, I think that the idea of the leitmotif, I think that's ancient history now. I, I don't think that's a part of modern scoring in any way. Mm. And I think that modern scoring is all based on one thing. And I'll explain. So in the classical and Baroque era, the only thing that mattered was the quality and craftsmanship of your work. That's it. If you were too original, you were frowned upon. It was not considered like, it's like, ooh, so avant-garde, perverse, you know, like it was really, you know, I mean, people fainted during Beethoven concerts because it was so avant-garde for the day. Right. Even think about his fifth symphony, bum, 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 bum. That mm -hmm. is not a melody. That's actually an abstraction in music. Um, and it's the first one, which is why that symphony is particularly brilliant. Mm -hmm. So the point here is, the only thing that matters today is originality. Craftsmanship doesn't matter anymore. And, you know, all that matters is like, yeah, man, I drove a tractor onto the stage playing guitar while being dunked in an aqua tank. And I plugged the microphone into the muffler of the tractor and then took the patch cord out, put a delay on it, and then stuck a French horn inside. And it's like, that's never been done, man. It's like, yeah, but was it any good? <laughs> you know? Is it right for the, the picture, the project? That's essentially, isn't well, that what it has to come down to? Yes, it, it does have to come down to that. But I guess, look, again, it's a double-edged sword, mm. originality. But I'll say this, that, and, and this is a secret that I will, I will give to anyone that wants it. This is what I tell everybody. It's not really a secret anymore, but... Uh, it's whenever you do a project, okay, with a budget, let's say, 
make a set of record, don't even write a note, just spend, if you've got, let's say three months to deliver the project, spend one month just recording original unique sounds, just do design sounds in your studio, make things that are really truly otherworldly and, and just new and startling and possibly shocking. And don't write a note with them, just make a library of sounds. Then the next two months you score using those sounds. And of course you do proof of concept for the client, right? So that they can sign off on the direction creatively. Yes. So then here's the trick though. This is the secret sauce. Never use those sounds again for any other project. Okay. Just use them on one project because what you will then be able to do when it, look, I once met with the one of the creators of the original Halo and, you know, Is I that got a to the video end. game. Halo. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend that I'm, oh, but that's like saying is psycho a movie. <laughs> <laughs> At least I got it right. It is a video game. Good. It is a video game. I won't and it's, lie. It's, I'm, I'm not a gamer. I'm, okay. Well, that's okay. That's okay. I, I'm not being prejudiced, but okay. <laughs> it's one of the most important video games ever made. Anyway, so I had a meeting with him and he straight up asked me, David, look, you know, I get hit up by hundreds of composers and I'm in the process of interviewing, you know, a lot of them right now. Why on earth would I choose you over another one? And that was my answer because that's what I was doing. You know, when I did X-Men Mutant Academy, the video game, which came out with the movie, just to be clear for Activision, they right. make games. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I did exactly that. I spent a month just making sounds and two months writing the music. And then I never used those sounds ever again on any other project. Mm -hmm. And so that soundtrack has a really unique signature sound. Mm -hmm. So right. um, so I said to, to him, I said, because I will do that for your project. I will record a unique sa sound palette, tone palette, that will be unique to your video game. And then I'll never use it for any other game after. And, uh, and he just went like this. He went, hmm. <laughs> you know, okay. so now I didn't wind up getting the gig because he wanted somebody in the city he lived in. And I was in Toronto at the time. So, so I didn't get the gig. He just said, look, I got to have someone here in Seattle who, you know, can, you know, work on site. And I was just like, I totally understand. He's like, but I love your stuff. And, you know, anyway, whatever. Mm. So. Mm. So originality, unfortunately, is a blessing and a curse in this day and age. We have the freedom to be as original as we want, but unfortunately, it's producing a lot of garbage and standards are going down. So a lot of people just don't know the difference between a high quality, well-produced master recording mm. and, you know. that it, it is ironic because, I mean, being a composer, I, I try not to think too much about the pressure of being original. You know, because that kind of is, I, I don't know, I, I sort of um, cringe when I think of releasing something maybe. And I think, oh God, it sounds like blah, 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 you know. And I've had these conversations where you say, well, everything sounds like something and everything is just a, a rehash or a remix, you know, and we should, but but we should all be striving true. for originality. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know that that's true, number one. Mm. I think that 90% of, yeah, everything out there right now is derivative. I mean, Star Wars is 100% derivative. Right. And so I mean, I've... everything, I think everything about Star Wars is derivative. Mm -hmm. The plot, the characters, the editing style, the music, everything. It's all derivative from other things that already existed. Um, even the story of Luke Skywalker is directly taken from the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the story of Arjuna, who has a series oh. of dialogues with Krishna, who is a spirit guide, you know, wow. and he has to face is to face killing his own uncle and oh. because his uncle is disturbing dharma which is a sanskrit word that means balance truth harmony many things okay. and in order to restore dharma he has mm. to kill his own uncle who is evil and okay. and disturbing dharma well doesn't that sound a lot like the force yeah mm -hmm. and luke facing his own father to yeah. restore balance to it well it's it's taken right out of the the Bhagavad Gita. Anyway, so, but that's not the point. Lucas did something amazing with it and fresh and original. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Korngold, who's the composer uh, that wrote the soundtrack uh, King's Row in yes. 1942, 
Right. So this is where John Williams, it was his <laughs> stomping grounds, and he hung out there for a long time and basically lifted the entire orchestration and theme mm -hmm. from Eric Korngold, but he made it better. He made it a more memorable theme and a more memorable melody. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you, they're actually a semitone apart. And if you put them in exactly the same key, literally they're indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. um, but John Williams did what he was told to do. Lucas said, here's the keys to the 20th century lot. I want to do a big epic adventure from the forties. You know, I want to remake that style. Mm -hmm. So find me some music like that. And that's what I want in this movie. Mm -hmm. So John Williams was a pro. He acted as a professional and he did his job. So okay. I don't fault him at all for stealing that music so do you um, think john williams chose to base it on that reference track it wasn't lucas because i wanted to ask you about that as well about clients expectations yeah. and the use of yeah, reference sure. tracks and temp tracks well, and how do you manage that in terms of your right. own creative choices sure well so we don't know what happened exactly i'm i'm only going on watching interviews of George Lucas talking about the music. And he said, look, you know, I said to Johnny, he calls him Johnny. I said, look, Johnny, I want to do a big action picture style, like from the 1940s, you know, mm -hmm. can we, can we find some scores like that and then bring them into the, you know, modern mm -hmm. age of the seventies. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm speculating as an artist and somebody who's worked with clients before mm -hmm. on big projects who had temp music, and uh, so my view on temp music is that it's one of the most dangerous things in the world. You know, um, if you look at the uh, soundtrack that never was to 2001, um, Alex North, who was the composer yes. hired yes. for that score. Right. And so, you know, Kubrick didn't even tell him on opening night. Oh, yeah, I pulled all your music out and I just went with all the temp. Yeah, I didn't so know that Alex he didn't North, tell yeah. him. Oh, no. he didn't tell him. Yeah, that's how the story goes anyway. And so he brought his family. He walked on the red carpet. His kids wow. were there, you know, and then like. That's there's cruel. there's, you know, uh, Strauss's music at the opening. And, right. and of course, it became the most I mean, people refer to that as the 2001 space odyssey space. music yeah first and even, foremost it's not yeah. also sprach zarathustra that's right. not how they know it mm -hmm. so which is really funny but that's how mm -hmm. pop culture works and functions right um yeah. yeah like like when i was growing up like if you said well it needs more cowbell like everybody would immediately burst in into hysterics but you probably don't find that funny at all do you because you well, don't know the reference, the pop culture reference that I'm referring to. But I know it's, anybody, a, it's a joke, but I might but know, you don't where, know where, where, where and what it's from. It's, it's <laughs> Will Ferrell's most famous moment on Saturday Night Live. Okay, basically. right. And okay. if you, it's, it's not as funny today, but back in the day, my God, was it ever funny. Um, anyway, the point is, this is pop culture and then things get passed down mm -hmm. and, and become a pastiche, basically, you know. And there are musical pastiches everywhere. And I think it's our job not to rely on those. So thank you, David and Karima. Uh, another great part of the interview there. I'll be sharing parts three and four later on in the very near future. But yeah, some great points there by David. He doesn't hold back. And uh, that's why it's so interesting to hear him. Uh, but what do you think? What's your experience? Uh, how do you deal with those questions of originality, pop culture, the expectations of others? the balances of sort of paying respect to or remixing some of the classics alongside doing something completely original. Do you think the quality of music in film and in game is in decline? Or do you think this is a brave new era and uh, things are moving forward to a bright, bright new future? What do you think? I'm really interested to hear what you've got to say. Interested to hear about your experiences and perspective on some of those points that David made. Uh, so take part in the discussion in the comments down below. Uh, I look forward to reading those. I'll share the rest of the interview soon, as I say. In the meantime, have a great day, everyone, and stay safe. Bye for now.